This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. The first marketing tool we'll look at is marketing research. Quite often you'll hear of market research, uh, but market research strictly just means finding out what the market is, who these people are who are buying from you. Marketing research looks at all aspects of marketing. All of the four or seven Ps really come into that. If you remember, we said marketing is really finding out about the customers, what they want, what they need, what their opinions are, uh, and then designing products uh, and selling products which meet those needs. So uh, underlying the whole idea of marketing is is us finding out information. It's not us assuming we know the information uh, and designing a product that's more product-led. We are humble. We need to find out information. So that marketing research can take uh, really three different divisions there are uh, here. Uh, desk research, uh, field research and test markets. So desk research is basically sitting at your desk and, and finding information which has already been collected. So you can find certain information just by searching on the internet. Uh, you'd need to find out who our main competitors are. Uh, do a Google. Uh, you need to find out what prices they're charging. Well, go and visit their website and see if they are divulging the prices they are selling. Uh, so if you're marketing holidays, they will tell you the prices they're selling. They're, you know, selling two weeks in Cyprus for in, in, in July and uh, so on. You'll also find uh, information on the internet that's published by governments. Uh, so there's information like uh, inflation rates. You'll find information about population sizes. You may find information about the affluence and the average income of people. Uh, and also you can find a lot of information, of course, internally. Uh, you know, we're selling a product. We're thinking, what do we do with it next year? Are we going to discontinue it? Are we going to price cut it a little bit to keep it going a little bit longer? Well, look at the sales of the product for each month over the last year. I exactly the sort of thing that you'd expect a, an IT system to be recording. Uh, and if you see that sales are pretty level, then you probably conclude it's got another year's worth of uh, marketing in it. But if the sales are going down like that, you have to make a decision, withdraw the product, or, or can we do something to kind of make that product come up again and maybe survive for another couple of years. Maybe we refreshen it. Maybe we cut the price. Maybe we have bundle it with another product. Uh, but uh, until we know what the product is doing uh, and what maybe our customers think about it, what the buying habits are, we, we can't do very much about it. Now, you will eventually run out of uh, information uh, uh, using desk research uh, there'll be certain specific questions which you need addressing. And for that, you uh, will design a questionnaire of some sort and you will go and ask people their opinion. It could be stopping people in the street and asking about what adverts they remember seeing on the television last night. Uh, and then you say, hmm, did you remember seeing any adverts about cars? And they say, yes, I saw an advert about Renault, uh, an advert about Seat. And they say, anything else? Did you remember seeing a, an advert about Volkswagen? Uh, oh, yes, maybe I did. So you're beginning to, to, to get information uh, about the effect of this advertising, whether it's stuck in people's minds. And this, by the way, is, is why advertising on the Internet has stolen an awful lot of money from conventional advertising uh, because if you look at an advert on an in the internet they can record you know who's seen it how long they looked at it did it make them click something else because it showed interest and so on but that's quite field research quite expensive and then there are test markets you're about to launch a new product uh, rather than making a kind of nationwide or international launch of a product, uh, it would be wise maybe to sell it first, try selling it first in maybe a particular town, which is representative, right type of members of the population, right affluence, uh, the, the, you know, advertising facilities that you intend to use and so on. 
And if it goes pretty well in this small sample test town, then you can be fairly confident that if I expand this to selling it nationwide, it's liable to work as well. If it doesn't sell well in the test area, then you know, be wasting your money probably going for a national launch. Types of uh, specific, maybe types of marketing uh, we have uh, here. There's business to consumer. So you have to go out and uh, basically look at members of the public and talk to members of the public, see what they want. Uh, there's business to business. It's much more concentrated marketing. Generally, if you're selling to consumers, there are tens of thousands of them. If you're selling to other businesses, there may only be a few hundred of them. Uh, and uh, probably some of those are what you would call your key customers. You, you know, 80% of your sales sold to 20% of your people. Uh, then you can go to those 20%, maybe five major customers, and you can really talk to them, get very close to them through your sales personnel about what they think of your product, what they want, uh, what their thoughts are. Then business to government, different uh, ball game altogether. Uh, selling to government often got very long time scales, often very strict procurement rules. Uh, but quite often the order, if you get it, is going to be huge. Uh, so it's worth working at. Uh, so it's a, it's not going to go very far in business government. It's a very, very specialist area uh, to be looking at. The other thing we need to just have some idea of the comparison is uh, the comparison between marketing services and marketing products. If you're marketing a product, you, 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 you tend to have all the products the same. I mean, that that's part of the almost what you expect in a product. <clears throat> every bottle of shampoo I buy, uh, I expect to be the same. Every you know Mars bar I buy, I expect it to be uniform, identical. Every you know particular model of a Nissan car I buy, uh, I expect it to be uniform. When you're buying uh, uh, services, they tend to be different. They tend to be heterogeneous. So you can't, you can't say, here's what you're getting. So I go into a sh car showroom, the, the, the salesperson can say, here's what it is, here's what a Volkswagen Golf looks like. You sit in it, uh, take it for a ride, you, you know. Uh, but if they're selling me a service like a holiday or a meal, uh, a theatre ticket, then they're going to have to adopt different ways of persuading me that what they're selling is what I want. Perishability. Uh, you cannot store services. You can't store hotel rooms. Uh, so, so if you know you're coming into a busy period and there are no hotel rooms in your hotel left, uh, then of course you might be able to put your prices up. Uh, if uh, you are in a slack period, then you're earning no revenue whatsoever in that room for that night it might be worth slashing your prices because a little bit of marginal revenue is better than nothing. Uh, whereas with products, if it doesn't sell, well, it just sits in inventory. You think it will sell. I won't make any more for a while, but it will sell. So you tend to have to be maybe thinking much more price volatility when you're selling services just to make sure that none perish. Uh, because that seat on that flight was empty and it can never be made available again. Intangibility, really going hand in hand with uh, heterogeneity, you can't show people what they're getting. Uh, and what you're going to be getting is probably individual, and you can't show it to them anyway, is kind of what we're saying. It's intangible. Uh, and so we need maybe to maybe convince them by our reputation that, okay, we can't show you the meal you're going to be getting, but our reputation and our two, two Michelin stars almost certainly means that you're going to be getting a, a good meal. Oh, you pay for it. Simultaneity. Uh, products could be made in January and sold in February or March. A service tends to be delivered instantly. So you get the meal within the hour in the restaurant. You buy your cinema ticket. You see the film 
immediately really uh, uh, so one of the things that, that's important here uh, is you get no chances to make it right so if I make a product uh, it can then be quality control tested uh, and if it's bad it can be sent back for repair or scrapped and it will never get to the customer if I make a bad meal and serve this to the customer uh, then there is immediate damage done uh, there is because of this immediate supply really the simultaneity there are no options of trapping these errors so reputation and reliability becomes a very important factor in selling services because there are no second chances and there is no transfer of ownership so it maybe doesn't make that much difference but it's usually trotted out here so if i uh, i'm selling uh, occupancy of a hotel i'm not selling the hotel room uh, i am selling your right to be there for a night or your right to sit in a theater seat for the night so people aren't going to leave with something in their pocket uh, uh, so to speak there's no transfer of ownership you are selling basically a period of time uh, uh, to people during which they're going to be getting that service other things just to look at briefly in uh, our uh, uh, marketing uh, uh, here uh, information needed to perform well while selling a service will also often be related very much to qualitative factors like uh, reputation uh, like your reputation for making good product for giving good service and, and, and so on rather than quantitative uh, aspects relationship marketing uh, relationship marketing uh, is uh, trying to get customer loyalty transaction marketing is where you're quite happy for a customer to come in by once and you've no expectation of seeing them again so it's very much like when you were buying raw materials on a kind of transaction basis from a supplier it's going to be quite a, a stern uh, 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 approach almost a slightly uh, aggressive approach here they want to buy what they want they want to buy it at a good price and then it's kind of goodbye relationship marketing is where you want them to come back you want to build up a relationship with this customer so that you become the supplier of choice they will not even think of going somewhere else when they did this product or service they will come to you automatically you are in a way their provider brand that they uh, recognize and trust and want to come to this is much better uh, in terms of uh, companies you emphasize customer satisfaction you get retention once they trust you then you can maybe extend what you're selling to, to other products and services and so on uh, so that over time you have this mutually beneficial relationship rather than a kind of hit and run transaction experiential marketing mm, we'll look at this very briefly sometimes called engagement uh, marketing on the ground marketing live marketing and so on you try to uh, directly engage consumers invite and encourage them to participate in the evolution of a product or a brand uh, so you would maybe let, let's say you were um, i don't know marketing some sort of adventure holiday uh, you might give them a day's worth of and say here are the sort of things we're doing on this adventure holiday uh, what do you think about it is it the sort of thing you would buy uh, we're running this in june do you want to button you know have two weeks of it kind of thing really and in, involve them letting them influence what they're going to be buying and what you're going to be selling and that's so they enjoy at least part of the experience uh, before they buy completely brands we've mentioned this very important uh, instant kind of recognition like a dog recognizes a bone uh, unique logo symbol uh, whatever 
so you recognize a particular make and if you trust and like that make you will go automatically and buy it again and brand owners work very very hard to protect their brand uh, to make sure it's not damaged by you know, cheap rip-offs and, uh, and so on uh, and sometimes brand or brand value can appear in financial statements if you can get a, a way of valuing it but that's notoriously difficult because a wrong step by a brand owner can ruin a brand overnight so if it's suddenly thought that the brand is maybe dangerous to health uh, then it's gone or if if you know, somebody of influence says I don't like that brand because then immediately the wealth of the, the worth of that brand can be undermined. It's a very very intangible asset. Two diagrams to uh, look at in terms of uh, marketing. First of all, there's something called a product life cycle. So here uh, we have uh, usually the so shown in four or five different uh, divisions if you like and this is a rather idealized uh, picture of what happens a product uh, or a company or a particular brand uh, perhaps so we could think that this here is following what's happening cars internal combustion engine if you like uh, so it's going up and there may be declining now internal combustion engines because of more and more electrically powered vehicles. It could be looking at you know what's happening say Jaguar Land Rover a particular brand if you like within car production and it could be looking at a particular model within ja Jaguar Land Rover so it could be done on a number of different levels industry company or model type of level and the idealized assumption is that you begin to launch the uh, product the earliest one here this is kind of your product development down here this is growth this is launch or development launch is the best one now what sort of information would you be interested in if you were launching a new product what information would you go to the finance department or, or hope that the IT system could, could give you very, very quickly. If you were in charge of the brand or in charge of this product, you would certainly be very nervous at this launch stage. Uh, what you don't want to see is the launch going like that, where sales are way below what you thought they would be. You're not going to get very long to save this product once it's, it's it's kind of looks like a failure and, uh, and and smells of a failure it's going to fail really so you have to think what on earth am i going to do here to try and boost the sales does it need more advertising uh does it need uh, a price drop do we need to temporarily withdraw it and see if we can relaunch it at least once but you're not going to get very long to uh, to make your mind up on the other hand what happens if your product goes like that fantastically successful as some of the Apple phones were and of course what happened was uh, that they couldn't keep up with demand uh, people got really irritated they wanted a phone and despite queuing around the block for all all day the, you know the Apple ran out of them and so on and that's not great either so what you are really really fascinated by here is early sales data is it going to plan? Is it selling in some parts of the country and not others? Is it selling through some outlets better than others and so on? So that you can refine your marketing effort for this launch. What happens up here is it's pretty uh, obvious that the thing is going to be a success. And some uh, companies, uh, their strategy is never to go into uh, a new market, but to wait and see. They don't want to take that initial risk but once they see a product that looks as though it's going to be successful then they jump in and and it's kind of copy me too so to some extent the you know the first company that produced um, tablet computers was apple people were a little bit skeptical at the start about how 
practically the computer would be without a keyboard and so on. But pretty soon it turned out there was going to be a spectacular success. And of course you had lots and lots of other companies then quickly coming into the market, hoping to leapfrog over Apple. What you want to do here is, if possible, to kind of stay ahead of the pack, you know, launch new products, replacement products, enhanced products and so on, so that you, having made all the going in the early days, can stay in front of the others uh, and maybe some will be frightened off. So you need to be uh, aware here of what, what your competitors are doing. You need to have IT systems uh, which can look at or, or try to identify what other products are being successful, what features do they have, do I need to put that to my product and so on, what prices are they selling at, I need to keep competitive and I'm going to stay up with the front runners within that. So IT, uh, terribly important to get these quick results. Up here at maturity, most people who want a product have one and the market stops increasing and what happens when the market stops increasing is the competition increases. So down here, when the market was increasing, every competitor in the market could increase their sales just because the marketing, the market was increasing. If the market is not decreasing, the only way I can increase my sales is by stealing market share from somebody else and the classic way of doing that is to drop your prices. So what you find up here, this slightly old product now, it's going to be very difficult to raise your prices, is that you the prices will come down. So that's the only way you're really going to keep increasing your revenue. And if prices go down, if you're going to make a decent profit, then costs will have to go down. How are we going to get costs down? Well, some companies can't and they will abandon the product. They will go out of the market. There's shakeout. The way other companies tend to do it is they consolidate. In other words, you tend to get mergers here. So if you think of the PC market, there are now maybe only three or four major computer manufacturers in, in the world. You've got you know, Lenovo, Apple, I suppose, and it's slightly different being it's slightly up market maybe. You have Hewlett Packard, maybe ASOS, uh, companies like that, but around a you know, small sort of number. But they are worldwide. And because they are worldwide, they have huge economies of scale in uh, research and development, in production, in the marketing. This brings their costs down and then they can still make a profit even though there's great price pressure in the saturated market. And of course, again, IT in the finance department becomes extremely important here. Uh, cost control becomes almost, you know, absolutely really essential in these mature markets. You can't put your price up. You survive by cost control and keeping your costs down. Out here, we're in a decline. What we have to do is maybe measure the size of the decline. Decline could take 10 years, it can remain profitable. We have to decide really whether we're going to get out quickly or whether we're going to stick in there for the last 10 years to become the last company standing, so to speak, uh, uh, it, it, and, and, and make a profit for that. In senility, most people get out there. The market's had it. Uh, we may as well get out, you, you know, knock down your factory, retool it, whatever it's going to do. Go on to the next product because that's the only way you're going to have a future. The other diagram we need to, to uh, look at is the Boston Consulting Group matrix, which again uh, tells us a little bit about what we should do with products. This has two axes it has market growth rate this is the total market growth rate whether uh, you know the total sales of a particular product are increasing like maybe mobile phones or cameras or laptops or uh, uh, dash cams or whatever whatever's going on 
Uh, and then you have relative market share, which strictly speaking is your share over the, the largest share. So if you are the largest player in the market, this will be one because your share and the larger share will be the same, be the same. So where this will start is, and where I started anyway, is here. So it's got a high market growth rate. This normally means it's a relatively new product because if you look back up at this here, this is where you get your high growth rate here. The steep lines are at the launch of a product and this implies it's got a bit of a future. So this is a, an attractive market to be in because it's growing quickly and it has a future. You want to be in there. But if you have a small market share, if you've got a market share of 2% and other people have market shares of about 30%, you can't last. It's going to be very difficult for you at your 2% share to compete with people with huge economies of scale with 30% share. So your choice here is to get out. That's why it's a question mark or a problem child. Get out or else you spend money to become a star. So here, the really the imperative is to build. Build your market share and that's cash negative. But you can't stay there. There's no long-term future in this pathetically small position in this very attractive market. Assuming you get up to star, star isn't as good as it sounds. Star is regarded as being roughly cash neutral. You are selling more, your market share has gone up, but it's still a very attractive market. Other people want to be in it uh, and you're going to have to fight them off. Uh, and, and you said here to hold. Now it's, it's like holding a fort, holding a castle, it's defending. So you have maybe the largest market share now, but the product is one that everybody wants to get into because they still perceive it as a future. You haven't to spend a lot of money protecting your pole position. So that's why it is about cash zero. You're getting a lot of revenue, but you still have a lot of costs. At some point, every market is going to stop growing. So if you look up here, you know, at this maturity stage, it's going to stop growing. So if every market stops growing, the market growth rate will fall. And if the market growth rate is negligible, this is perceived as a kind of yesterday's product, a market with not much future, and people are not going to make a huge fuss, if you like, a huge attack on a market which is perceived as being old. So here, they leave you alone. They leave you alone to enjoy the fruits of your old product. So this cash cow, as it suggests here, is very cash positive. And what we're really doing here is to harvest. So we've had all this hard work early on. Uh, and now what we're doing is at long last, uh, late in the day, perhaps, you know, towards the end of the year, we are now enjoying the fruits of our labor. We're getting money coming in. And that's hopefully going to last for some years. You know, we, we, we don't know how long this mature kind of phase is going to be. It could be a very slow decline. All of this is seen as a boring old product. None of the new people are going to make a big, a big dash to enter that market. They leave you alone to enjoy your rather obscure, uh, uh, perhaps little product. The dog ain't going nowhere. The dog doesn't form part of this uh, three, three, three stage process here, if you like. The dog, uh, we have something with a low market growth rate. So it's a kind of oldies product. You don't have much of it anyway. So just get out. Just uh, abandon, disinvest is what you would say here. Uh, you're not going to make anything of it very much. A 
Again, uh, the finance department is going to be looking very carefully at the, the profits in this cash cow here. Uh, this is where we're really reaping the benefit. This is again where we're going to have to be carefully watching costs. This is our chance at making profit. Here we know we're not going to make profit. Here the emphasis is not on making profit, but the emphasis on gaining market share uh, there. Uh, and as it says, what a, a nice balanced portfolio is, is if you have your... Let me just get rid of some of these here to make it a little bit easier to see. We have got our cash cows, which produce, produce positive cash flows. We have our question marks, problems which consume cash. And what we can do is to use the cash being generated by the cash cow to fund the development and the bringing on of your problem children. If you have only problem children, there's going to be a financing problem. If you have only cash cows, things are rosy now, but in three, four, five, six years time, when these cash cows have eventually had it and the product isn't selling and you've got no more products to bring on stream, so to speak, then you're going to hit hard times. So you want this nice balanced portfolio, some products generating the money, and this can be used to fund these new products, which are going to be our futures.